Though it appears like they are holding off because she is still too young and not quite opt to completely destroy everyone, I was kind of hoping that she would utterly dome some folks this episode. It would have been better to use the Elven 99 villain strategy and jump to her strong point at the school, but at least it helped to introduce the big cast of people and highlight her strengths in magic and swordplay for later. Her twisted reasoning suggests that she thinks being stronger than the heroine is a prerequisite for being a formidable villain, and what better way to prove it than by doing the actions the heroine would take, but more skillfully. She is a villain because she defies nobility and is hostile toward them, which is, I suppose, partially accurate from the perspective of nobility. I can already see that Alicia's villainy will consist of her opposing the sluggish nobles and battling for the kingdom's equitable and moral government. The fact that the king appears to be considering it helps her a little, and considering how much time they spend together in the op, I figure the prince will comply with her wishes when the time comes. As a result of her power and her alliance with the ordinary people against the noble narrative, she may turn out to be a somewhat populist royale. She may now return to that village and fuck up because she has perfected her magic abilities and swordsmanship to the point where she can lift heavy bookcases with ease. It will be fantastic practice for the villain to dominate the world and beat the shit out of people. I sincerely hope that this make doesn't wind up being just another cliched princess harem show and instead completely dismisses and kind of crushes all the love interests. Too many of these shows featuring villains have promising beginnings but ultimately devolve into corny, cliched romance programs. It's basically about her being a villainess, but I sincerely hope that with her strong attitude, she can break this and it doesn't happen. Although I typically adore these anime shows about villains, there's something about Alice's fixation on being a villain and only committing nice actions that just gets to me. This season's Perry anime is not even close to our thick mick from previous season, up to a point that was at least understandable. So Mel is some sort of contracted spirit that Duke has, and he's pursuing politics on his own. What's up with that? I wonder, without having lived in a village, no self-respecting villainess could discuss its state. Even more villainous is the act of slinking out of the house during the night. They were lying about how horrible Lona was. There is nothing to make this impoverished community worthwhile to live in, and the only reason people may stay there is because it is a prison colony. Therefore, Alicia is fortunate to have met Will, a kind and sensible guy, as opposed to the other option. Although Will, a former noble, defied the kingdom's rules and lost both his position and his side as a result, it hasn't diminished the wisdom and ethics he holds dear. He provides Alicia with sensible guidance and serves as a valuable sounding board for her journey to become the greatest villainess. Alicia found herself with a grandfather in the most unlikely of locations. There's nothing more villainous than flaunting your expertise as if it were second nature. Additionally, it appears that Alicia is already more well-liked than the heroine because Duke doesn't seem to mind if Alicia has rivals and all the males want a chance to be with her. Alicia is among the most energetic 10-year-olds ever. She'd even like to take the test on swordsmanship. Despite her young age and gender, her family completely acknowledges her abilities, especially when comparing her to her older brothers, so they do not undervalue her. She's simply too young to make a big impression. She still clings to her plush bunny when she gets angry. After all, she is 10 years old. It's clear from Alicia's warning not to visit Lona during the day that things there are much worse with people abusing and murdering one another, including children. It also helps Alicia recognize how fortunate she is at her station and how little meaningful action she can take. However, no villainess will be outclassed by her surroundings or the heroine, so she must do what she can and vow to absorb as much knowledge and training as possible in order to grow into an even more formidable and capable villainess. Did Alicia's magical abilities just uncover a library filled with all the magical tomes she could ever desire? Was it always around or could she have practically summoned it due to her tremendous magic potential? In any case, magic has now been unleashed by our villainess. Showing off how far Alicia has come as a villainess, including criticizing the class system and remaining confident despite having a splitting headache from using her magic too much, is the ideal setting for an audience with the monarch, but her bold, yet true, words and beliefs continue to enchant the king. 
Alicia consistently finds herself in heroine-like situations with Duke, despite being the villainous rather than the heroine. Some examples of these situations include him recognizing her illness right away, picking her up after a fall, putting her to bed, tending to her when she's ill, and of course giving her medicine with a kiss. Well, the youngster was definitely thirsty. I've never understood how the antagonist from the first game could possibly meet the protagonist maybe at school, given their stark age disparities. Heroin is most likely five years older than Conquerable Goals. Since this is a different universe, perhaps the school requires seven or more years of study. But I don't know, though strange, I'll put my mind to rest for today. There are aspects of this show that I like. I enjoy how Alicia's villainous look is evolving, becoming less of an O Pritch girl and more of a revolutionary hero. I appreciate how the stupid head of house corrects her when she answers the king, so demonstrating her argument, the spooky, forced romance between the 10-year-old girl and all the adult-looking young men bothers me. And I especially dislike the prince's sulky, possessive behavior. You really can't tell me that the medicine kiss was necessary? He didn't even attempt to assist her in taking a sip of it beforehand. It's quite disgusting. Seeing Alicia fall short of being a genuine evil is entertaining. She will become even more strong and holy than heroin if she continues on this path. She's adorable when she tries so hard to be the perfect villain, so I have nothing against it. It doesn't help that she already possesses more swordsmanship than a youngster does. Adding her magical training to this will make her become like Yamiela in the classroom. I wonder if Alicia's talk with the king will bring about any changes in Moana. Will said that given how intelligent Alicia is, Jill would make a fantastic attendant. Her insistence on passing the sword test was admirable as well. It may have been even more uncompromising than simply bringing it up for discussion at the age of 15 and appreciated that magic was used to conceal the magical library. Given that she spent all of her mana, what are the chances that she is ill? I would have loved to kiss if Alicia had been a little older, but even with today's time travel, she is still too young for her harem to really take off. I'm looking forward to seeing how Alicia's villainous rationale compares to the Saintess they described in the last episode. Her reasoning is very amusing. Grandpa will says that the way he's positioned in the opening suggests that he's being set up to be her mentor and Jill will be her assistant or something. I believe that gray-haired noble in the gray suit will eventually become an opponent in the series because he seems to take Alicia's remarks far too personally. I don't know how, but I have a feeling that when we see the person again, we won't like it. Having said that, I wonder why the final scene was included. The Princess Carrie and Duke's care of her were acceptable, but the damn medicinal kiss was needless. It might have been okay if it had happened later when she was older and knew Duke better, but for now, it makes me feel uneasy. It has already been brought up, I know, but Prince Duke, who the hell names a character that? A child born into a royal family would never be named after another aristocratic title. Since many princes are also dukes, it makes even less sense, William. Prince of Wales, for instance, holds the titles of Prince and Great Steward of Scotland, as well as Duke of Cornwall, Duke of Rothesay, Earl of Carrick, Baron of Renfrew, and Lord of the Isles. 